can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Scott Markman of the monogramgroup.com. And Scott has been doing this agency and business thing for, I'm not going to age you too much, Scott, but like decades and decades. Um, So he's got a lot of experience to share um, and a lot of exciting stories. Um, And before we dig into it, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. Scott and Rod Holmes. Uh, we wouldn't have met without Rod Holmes, even though we probably at one point lived a mile from each other uh, in Chicago. Uh, Rod Holmes runs Pilot Digital, and he actually talked about niching and growing your agency by using cash flow. And we're going to talk about niching too um, with Scott. Um, we have, I've had on Jason Swank, who Scott also knows. Um, he built up his agency to over eight figures and sold it. And then recently he's been buying up agencies. He also runs the agency group. Um, I had Todd Tasky. Um, he has a second bite podcast. He pairs, this is actually in Scott's world. Um, they help a lot of private equity companies. So Todd, pairs an agency with private equity and helps agencies sell to private equity. And he calls the second bite because sometimes those agencies, when the private equity sells the group the second time, they make more on the second bite than they do on the first. So his is really interesting talking about agency valuations and and, uh, M&A stuff. That was really cool. So check more of those out on inspiredinsider.com. Uh, This episode is brought to you by Rise25. And at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the strategy, the full accountability and the execution. You know, Scott, we call ourselves the magic elves that work in the background to make it look easy for the host and the company. So they could just (laughs) focus on the relationship and run their business. You know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past 15 years to profile the people and companies I most admire and share what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. Scott actually has a podcast. You can check it out on monogramgroup.com, the podcast page. Um, You should. And if you have questions, go to rise25.com and support at rise25.com. We're happy to answer them. We have many episodes on our podcast that actually answer the most frequently asked questions. So you can get those for free on the podcast. So uh, without further ado, Scott Markman is the founder and president of Monogram Group. They're a global brand consultancy and creative branding agency based in Chicago with over 40 years of experience. He's led clients across diverse sectors, consumer products, B2B, nonprofits, but they are the leaders in rebranding for the private equity sector. They have served over 80 private equity clients, over 30 portfolio companies in the past almost 30 years. And you can check them out at monogramgroup.com. Scott, thanks for joining me. It's such a pleasure to be here, Jeremy. Thank you very much. So just tell people a little bit more about Monogram Group and and what you do. Sure. So um, if you ask 100 people, what's a brand, you'll get 100 answers. And, you know, that's both an opportunity and a challenge. Because if people understood brands, how to develop brands, how to uh, launch brands, how to curate brands, I wouldn't have a job. But there's a huge market for what we do. So a lot of times you get an answer, well, a brand's a logo, right? Starbucks, Nike, you know, Apple, blah, blah, blah. And it's not wrong. It's just, you know, a quarter of a percent of what a brand is. It's the visual manifestation, like a little symbolic piece of it that, you know, you need to, you know, use proactively. But a brand is so much more than that. I tend to use an easy example, a metaphor to frame up how we describe brand and what we're hard to work on. So the example of Starbucks, we all buy Starbucks. We all stay in line. We all have one of 10,000 drinks that, you know, options we give to the barista. And then you, you pay your money and you walk down to the end of the aisle and you wait two minutes or a minute and a half to get your drink. Thank you very much. So everything around that company, their products, 
their store environment, the training of their baristas, their price point, their you know, uh, uh, selection of sandwiches, everything that you can humanly think of is a part of that brand. But you, if you think about the internal and external audiences of that company and how they need to interact with them and deliver value to them, that's really where brand becomes robust and diverse and deep and interesting. So if you think about consumers, Jeremy, you and I go to Starbucks all the time. But guess what? They have uh, consumers in places like China. And I've been there. I did business there for nine years. And there's a lot that's very similar to walking into a Starbucks in Beijing or Shanghai and some things that are wildly different. So consumers are all over the place. The second of which is uh, their employees. We all know baristas, but there are guys in the warehouse and there are people that drive trucks and all of that stuff. The third of which would be their suppliers. So coffee growers in Guatemala and people who supply the paper cups and all of it. The fourth, you might imagine, would be Wall Street because they're a public company. And if you own shares or you're an analyst, you interact with a company in a certain way. And the fifth that I would tell you is social media. Because to that company, the social media universe is incredibly important and, and part a huge part of the brand. Now, if you think about these audiences, they all interact with a brand every single day, and they have wildly different self-interest, meaning, who are you? What are you going to do for me? And why should I care? And what are my options? Because we can all walk down the street and go to Duncan, and a bunch of people do. Not my thing, but a lot of people do. So... You have to be able to think about how to answer those questions from a brand perspective every day, all the time, into the definite future, and understand that the self-interest in those answers wildly differ from market or audience or segment to each other. Employees, consumers, um, suppliers, Wall Street, and the social media, they all only care about their own self-interest. What are you going to do for me? Because as consumers, with all due respect to the baristas, we don't care. We just want them to be there, deliver a smile, take my order, move on. We don't care about the health benefits. But you know what? That's why a lot of people work there. I'm not mean about it today, but historically, was because they offered health benefits for part-time workers. So that self-interest is wildly diverse, but you only get one brand, right? You only get one brand. So the challenge and the complexity of brand work and brand uh, strategy and advisory work and execution and creative and messaging is how can you make all that work? Foundationally, uh, the metaphor I use is you grab a flag and you plant it in the hill and then you defend it. That's a brand. And this complexity is there all the time. And so the work that we do is mostly evolutionary. We don't blow stuff up that often. It happens occasionally. But, you know, the word rebranding typically means blow it up and build, you know, Humpty Dumpty, build it back together again. We do some of that work. We do some brand creation work, you know, corporate carve out. Somebody has an idea for a company, they need a brand. We, we're working on one of those gigs this summer. Most of the work that we do is evolutionary. And what I describe it as taking the Queen Mary and moving it seven degrees to the left in the horizon. It doesn't seem very big, but steering a big ship in a different direction is hard. But once you get to the horizon, that seven degrees becomes pretty important, and it's it's future looking. That's most of the work that our agency does. So again, there's a certain skill set to a brand evolution, repositioning, as opposed to blowing stuff up or invention. Again, we do it all, but two thirds of our work is in the evolutionary stage. And so that's maybe I hope a pretty good overview for you and your listeners and watchers as to kind of the work we do. I'm wondering the process, what does that look like? Because when you say this to me, it seems, um, you know, really complicated. I don't say that in a negative way, but like there's so many different directions you can go. There's so mm -hmm. much, you can, so many places you could start. So I like to learn when someone comes to you, what does that process look like? Because like you said, and we're going to talk about niching, you know, you have gone into different sectors in niche. And we talked about private equity, even if you look at mm -hmm. consumer goods. So anyone who's listening to this, whatever company you have, like I remember when I had the founder of RX Bar on, originally mm -hmm. they niched to CrossFit people, right? The, anyone could eat uh, the bar, obviously, but they, they niched. So, and this kind of goes into 
the broader scope of what does their brand look like? Who are they speaking to? So a company comes to you, what does that process look like? Where do you even start when you're talking about branding or rebranding? I'm going to give you, Jeremy, a two-part answer. Um, our agency is extremely uh, committed to and immersed in research and insights. Now, that's not unique. I mean, I will tell you that everything that we do, anybody in branding, there's no proprietary anything. So that's the backdrop here. Having said that, people have skill sets and focuses and priorities that, that differ. We are deeply grounded in research and insights. And there's a reason. Um, I had a longtime partner, Jackie Short, um, who was an res extremely sophisticated research professional. She came out of corporate America. She ran research at Ameritech in the 90s. I mean, she was you know, a dudess, right? And she re is really a, one of two people who taught me the discipline, the priority, and the process of research, both quant and qual. A vast majority of the work that we do involves qualitative research, executive interviews. I sort of do this kind of stuff like you're doing with me, but you know, with internal constituents and external constituents for our clients. Now, it then further divides into two parts. In private equity, I've done probably 500 of these in the last seven years. So with every interview, I have no notes. I just know what I'm trying to elicit. And I, and I start a conversation and I have a certain process, my talking points, like you're doing with me, this kind of stuff. And I approach those in a certain way. But for, let's say, a portfolio company or a big public company, the work that we do, you're probing into stuff that you're loosely familiar with and you have a sense of what you're trying to gain out of it. But the questions you ask has got to be a lot more here. You know, you have to get them approved by the client. Here's the 12 things I'm going to ask. We're going to do it over dozens of interviews, not 15. And it takes longer uh, and it's more of an investment. But I will say that um, we always say that the heavy lifting, the hard work is done there at the front end of these engagements. Figuring out who the hell are you? What are you going to do for anybody? Why should they care? And how do you tell that in a two minutes or less succinct story that hundreds of thousands of people across the enterprise are going to articulate through the written word and verbally and visually and all of that stuff? That's freaking hard. By the time that is approved, iterated and approved, and we get into the creative, it's downhill skiing. It's fun. It's easier. It's, an, it's a little more, you know, it's a little bit more enjoyable because I love the creative process because I'm a designer by training. I'm a creative. I'm, I, I be, I'm a creative who became a researcher and a strategist. Um, and so I love the creative process. I love just logo design. I love writing. I love video development. I love podcasts. I love the creative expression is really cool. But I also love the front end because I learned to be, you know, kind of good at it. And and to be the you know kind of the dude in my agency to kind of own that piece of it, and you know we do we're doing work now for two gigantic global brands. One's a public company; they make products, industrial products, and one is a, uh, a private equity firm that's in infrastructure, and they're in seven continents, and they manage a ton, ton, a ton of money. It's so cool to do the work. And to then sit back and think, well, okay, how do, how do you piece all that together? And how do you present it? And how do you express strategy is so much fun. And it's hard. It's really hard, but it's like intellectually rewarding. And so I happen to really like it. Now, I'm not, I'm not a creative really in the agency anymore. Other people, you know, the rest of my partner, the rest of the team, they're brilliant at what they do. And I, I, I come along for the ride and I make sure that things are staying on brand and matching the strategy, but I'm not doing the doing any, anymore. And, and that's fine too. What's uh, Scott, you've, you've done in your company has done, who knows, tens of thousands of these type of interviews uh, with executives and people from the company. Do you remember an answer that an example of an answer that stuck out that helped you get to kind of the core essence of a brand. Yes. Let's talk about that. I literally was talking about this with my partner about an hour ago. So we have, we have a client, a private equity client in um, Little Rock, Arkansas. They're called Stevens Group. It's a family office, uh, wildly successful, wildly interesting. But the, but the history and the issues 
that we were asked to, you know, kind of weigh in on and, and kind of uh, solve for them are more deep and robust and nuanced and complex than the, you know, typical private equity firm. This is a family. It's the multi-generational family. And so we've had to do a much deeper three-dimensional dive into that than most PE clients. And there was a, one interview I did, this is about two months ago, a gentleman that has known his family for decades and, and was close friends and business associates with you know, my client's father who started the whole enterprise. And he, in, in the answer to a question, to, to sort of solve the culture, that kind of stuff, I'm directly correct. He said, you know, I would play poker with these folks over the telephone. Hmm. He said more in seven words than the next 60 and the next 60 interviews put together. Because you think about the implication of what he said, let alone the uniqueness of it. And he didn't think twice about it. I'm sure he's given that answer a hundred times to describe the relationship with his family. I trust them so much that I would play poker with them over the telephone. I mean, if, if I'm in search of great metaphors and great visuals and great symbolism, I couldn't think of a better answer. Like, I, I almost could have been done with the process. I know where to go with this. It was brilliant. It was, it was not, it was, he was not trying to, he was not trying to be clever or cute. It was, it was just a natural answer. And again, I think he's probably said a hundred times. It was awesome. I love that. How does, so now this, like you said, it's downhill skiing. Once you do all this research, to me, it doesn't, I mean, you've done this. This is your expertise. To me, it doesn't seem like downhill skiing. It seems like there's a lot of work to be done. What is, how does that, that research translate into now the, what you do for people and visually, right? With their logo and their brand. So, um, we live in a world of ideas and creative, meaning visual expression, comes from foundational ideas and foundational ideas come from positioning and strategy and insights. So there's an A leads to B leads to C to all of this. And the, the challenge, you know, the hard part of this is the nuance. And you think about all the factors that you control, you know, the logo, colors, fonts, Style of language, is it business and crisp or is it conversational and warm? Um, all these nuances not only have to tie from the expression back to the strategy and insights, but they have to tie to each other, meaning the colors need to relate to the fonts, need to relate to the language, need to relate to the photography and the video. Like, and you know, when you go to a website and you design the, you know, the user experience, it all has to tie together. It all has to go back to that flag we talked about, you planted in a hill and defend. And there's clearly an art to that. You know, I mean, in, in quotes, or I mean, literally, I mean, figurative art to that. There's a, there's a nuance to it. There's a, a deftness to that that only comes from experience. Now, the great thing about our shop is that we only have senior creatives. Everybody who touches the work is at least 20 years up to 40 years of experience in what they do. And so, no disrespect to young, young, brilliant creatives, he, 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 you know, there's no shortcuts. And to have people who've been around 100 blocks a thousand times working together and have worked together, together for a long time, it's just, it's more gratifying. It's more, it's more nuanced meaning the work that you can achieve is just more complex and nuanced and you're just operating on a different plane. You know, it's like, uh, you know, Tom Brady could do what Tom Brady did because he had done it 10,000 times in addition to being brilliant. But, you know, Tom Brady, 10 years in his career, approached it differently than he was one year in his career with the same talent set. So there's just some of that going on in our shop. We're just, it's a cohesive team. We're all, you know, singing from the same you know, hymn, hymn book. And we know what the hell we're doing. And, and so we also know how to present and how to persuade clients to buy the work we want them to buy. There's an expression in our shop. And again, we didn't make this up. The best work never sees the light of day without a client who will buy it. And so there's an art to the presenting and to the persuading. We don't ever walk in with one answer to anything. It's like, 
here's your answer ever. You know, with locos, we're going to show six. And, and, you know, we, we rank order them and you know, we don't tip our hand, but once we present to the client, we get the reaction, then we'll say, okay, here's what we would do. And, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, and sometimes it's a compromise, you know, with a term we use as Frankensteining, right? A little bit of this, a little bit, rack it together. Okay, that's to be expected. And you even have to manage the Frankensteining to arrive at something that they feel good about and you feel good about. And it was a compromise. That's, you know, the art of compromise is a big part of the journey. I want to, since this is a very visual conversation, I want to uh, share a couple things uh, from your website real quick. So I'm going to pull up. Um, if you are listening to the audio, you'll be able to watch this, uh, the video piece as well. <clears throat> what we're looking at here is we're on monogramgroup.com. I've already pulled up. If you go to their work page and I, you know, since I know you specialize in private <laughs> equity, I pulled up um, the private equity piece. I mean, there's other categories here, mid market and national global and others, you know, there's a, a, a number of things here, but I have the private equity just for this conversation. We're looking at, and I pulled up PSP partners. So I'd love to talk through a few um, examples so people can kind of visualize. So right here, we're on the page uh, PSP partners, and mm -hmm. we're looking uh, at this. Um, tell, like, obviously, someone's like, oh yeah, you just put PSP partners here and a couple things. Like, there was a lot of work that went into this. Um, what did it look like before versus after? And what was the feeling before versus after? It's a great question. And I'll try and give, you know, in a, in a, in a, a concentrated way, sort of a multi-part answer. First of all, for those who don't know, PSP Partners is the family office of Penny Pritzker, who is famous and respected and, you know, plays a leadership role in politics and business, both in Chicago and our country. She's world-renowned and world-respected and all that comes with that. And so the, uh, the complexity of, you know, what we have been asked to do, again, which is to, is to build the brand of her office and obviously by extension her, First of all, it's been an incredible honor. We've worked for them for about four or five years, and this went live, I don't know, maybe six months ago. Um, but P Penny has built such a, a spectacularly accomplished and successful team and works hard to strike a balance between, you know, look, at the end of the day, this is, this is her, her office, but making sure that she puts her team and the leadership team in in the appropriate i'll call it level of kind of public expression and and influence and all of these things and the culture is so important to them that again um this is almost like a um, like a mission driven um exercise much more so than 90 percent of our private equity clients it's just a, it's a bigger picture, more robust, almost more personal uh, dimensions to, to the exercise. Now, there are certain things that, you know, we didn't touch. I mean, the, the logo with those uh, uh, rectangles is not our work. We inherited that. And there's a good reason for it. You know, Penny's original investment platform was real estate. And, you know, coming out of her family, you know, founded high hotels. And so, you know, she just wanted to stay with that. And, and so we a little bit built around it. Now, what you look at here, what you're showing the screen, Jeremy, is our work, which is brand architecture, which is managing levels and pieces that have to act on their own, but come together into some cohesive whole is brand architecture. And so the nomenclature, PSP partners, meaning they used to be called some, it was a little bit different. That's our work. And then the way in which the divisions, capital growth, risk, particular realty group, asset management are kind of staged. And, and solidified visually to have a, a version of a, a collection of logos that are used in certain situations by, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of people is, was our influence mm. um, and our, you know, our, uh, our, our actual work. Um, and so it's a, you know, this, again, it's very bespoke. It's, it's a mixture of what we inherited, what was off limits and what we were asked to make better and to organize and solidify for easy expression and usage across their footprint. 
So what was it like before? Yeah. They just had, was it just PSP partners or what, what, what did it look like before? Um, no, the, the, the umbrella name was, I think was PSP Capital Partners, but you see Capital was a division. And so there was, there was confusion. And so, again, these are not gigantic moves, but they're important moves, if that makes sense. And a lot of it was around clarity and consistency. Um, I will tell any client of any stripe and any business circumstance that the mission of brand work is focus and clarity and consistency. And if you can master, or we together can master that, any brand, I don't care if they're a $4 billion company or down to a startup, is 90% ahead of the game. It's like field the ball short and throw it to first. And, you know, when we talk about message, when we talk about design rules and nomenclature rules, just agree to it, have everybody execute along the same lines, and just rinse and repeat all the time. You're so far ahead of the game because most businesses don't do this. Um. So PSP partners, and then um, I pulled up uh, prospect partners. Um, okay. Talk about this one. Sure. Very different situation. So also based in downtown Chicago, these two firms are two blocks from each other. Yeah, yeah, four blocks. Um, so prospect partners, um, there were two gentlemen that started this firm, very successful investors. And they had brought in a second uh, generation of, of leaders. And when we were brought in there, um, they were transitioning. The two gentlemen who started it were a little bit kind of phasing out. They were kind of retiring. And the three guys who were in their you know, early 40s um, who had been brought in to take over the firm were kind of in the process. There's two of the three right there, um, Eric and Brett. But they had, you know, they had never, ever, 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 ever invested in brand and marketing because the two founders just, A, didn't believe in it, and B, were successful in spite of it. And so who is to tell them otherwise? Well, they had some stumbles about five years ago, not a major, but enough that when this transition of, of generations was happening, you know, these, these are three partners here as our long-time clients sort of said, we're going to do things differently. We believe in different things and we need to kind of, I'll call it, take back our reputation and, and our message out there. And so the mess, the mandate here was to blow stuff up. And to really take a baseball bat to things. So literally every shred of what you're showing on the screen right now, this has gone through like two cycles, is us. Every every word, every idea, that design, that logo was if I showed you the before and the after, you you would almost you would laugh. They went from like the Philistines to the Olympics and with nothing in between, nothing in between. And it's and frankly, it's one of the cases I'm most proud of because the impact was so dramatic and so immediate and you know they're doing great things with the firm now um that it's a wonderful relationship and uh you know they've been a long-time client you know scott why do people end up coming to you um in this case because it, obviously most people aren't coming to you being like listen i don't believe in it we've done fine without it those people aren't coming to you right um but there's some something that happens in their trajectory of their company that makes them change their course or, or their thoughts, you know, in this case, it was a, a generation coming in. What are the, usually the reasons, or the, I'm sure there's a multitude of reasons of why people come to you and go, this is, and think now this is important now. Sure. So one thing to note for you and your listeners is that I, or we do not convince any prospect to address their brand ever. Because if we did, I would get thrown out of the boardroom. Every prospect, this is maybe- It's like someone telling months. someone uh, their baby's ugly sort of thing. Thank you. Yes, that would be a wonderful metaphor. Um, prospects self-select in. At the leadership level, they have identified that there's a trigger Something's broken, something has changed, a merger, something is being started up and they just flat out need something, right? Um, leadership has self-identified that they have a need for the expertise that we represent. Now, uh, this is interesting. Um, a lot of our brethren skew more towards the creative side. 
hey, look at our stuff. We just do great creative and you should talk to us. We show that stuff, but we don't, we don't really flash it around. If somebody feels that way, terrific. But the reason people self-select into us is because of this front end, the research, the strategy, the positioning, the message, who the hell are we? Which is almost an elemental need that most business people from this big to this big understand. And if they can't get their, you know, what together about that, they're going to struggle. And so it a lot of times it triggers a website. Um, it's out of date. It sucked. Um, people have left. I mean, there's there's some almost uh, tangible trigger, but oftentimes it's just, you know, we haven't touched this for like six years and it's time to blah, blah, blah. Uh, we have a huge client. I mentioned this, um, this, this global infrastructure uh, client, uh, 40 billion under asset. The, the offices in like seven continents or, you know, I mean, seven countries in like five continents. And they're, they're 10 years old and they have, you know, they're like a, you know, six foot nine, you know, teenager that's playing basketball. And they looked, they looked around and, you know, management sort of said, look, it's time. There are lots of uh, infrastructure improvements and changes. We're doing big picture in this firm for the next 10 years. And this needs to be a part because right now the website is one page, no information. And it's like, it's almost like a landing page. And that's it. So we were hired to kind of build all this out and again, to take them from zero to 60 in two seconds. Um, because all of a sudden it became a really important thing and, and rightfully so. So um, again, management founders on down to second level leaders are, are gonna find somebody and they found us because we have all this experience and we had to compete and we won the business. Um, and so it's, it's, like, it's like building a 60 story building. I want to talk about niche for a second and the evolution of your company, what niches you've gone through. I know you're right. I mean, you've been focused on uh, private equity and I know you've been there. You've gone away from it and come back to it. So I want to hear mm -hmm. about why, because when I think of what you do, I think for some reason, I don't know why in my mind, I think consumer products, consumer packaged goods, like they're always you know, what I see there is like, how do I experience this company and brand? Um, so talk about the niches that you've served, a little bit of the evolution, and then, you know, maybe some of the advantages and disadvantages of niching. Sure. So this is a conundrum and a challenge for anybody who owns any agency of any stripe. And, and it, we even see this on, on the private equity side. People want to cast a wide net. I want to bring all the opportunities in. Well, that works and it sort of doesn't. Because especially as the business world has evolved and, and brand and expertise and, and B2B versus B2C, the reality is we are well served to create inflows of opportunity to win gigs and candidly the fees we get um, if you are selling a deep expertise. In private equity, we probably win 75% of our proposals. And the only, almost only reason we lose is price. Meaning somebody just decided we're too rich for the blood. They can find somebody who's like, you know, a B minus, but for half the price and they're local. And okay, great. So, I, I, we understand. So in private equity and the portfolio company work, where I, I win less, but again, we have a built-in advantage. The the calculus, the algebra of of, of leads and, and proposal writing and, and closing deals and doing the work, all of it is just a certain way. When we get into the general corporate world, we're competing against gobs and gobs and gobs and gobs of firms. I mean, I think the number is like, there are like 5,000 firms in America that claim some branding expertise. And in, in the mid-tier, meaning be below the global bad boys, right? If we're in that mid-tier, we're the run to that tier, but we're firmly established. We compete with hundreds and hundreds of excellent firms and it's a little more of a kettle call and our win rates probably 25 percent or 20 percent so we like the balance because of i'll call it um, intellectual curiosity and just you know we love taking on things we haven't done before and intellectually and creatively you kind of need that but you know what pays the bills and and is the growth engine of the agency is private equity and portfolio companies for the the reason you described jeremy which is um 
it, people are seeking deep, proven expertise. And that's a business issue. And so it's an easier game for us to play. And, and I'm happy to, you know, ride that wave to growth for a long period of time because, you know, I'm trying to grow the agency and you know, I'm probably, I don't know, four or five years from selling it. And um, I love what I do, but I'd like to get, you know, can only five years from now get paid more to, to sell the agency than I have right now. That's what I do. So what made you get away from it and come back to it? Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll, you know, be transparent about this. Um, we had a, in 2015, early 2016, we we're doing fine, but we, we, we hit the perfect storm in a bad way. After a period of about a year of doing pretty well, there was a period of six months where I went like over 20 in proposals. And there was no logic to it. There was, there was nothing to be learned. It was like, we'll do this differently and this will change. It was just God decided that we were going to, you know, be at be the Sahara Desert for um, six months. And it was getting pretty desperate. And, and I thought, you know, with my partner, like, what, what, what are we going to do? Well, the answer was to lean as heavily as we could and back into private equity. We had about two or three clients at the time. But it was on that sort of end of that three-year cycle where we just sort of said, you know, not for us. We just a little bit sick of it. And we said, you know, out of sheer necess you know, necessities and mother invention kind of stuff, we said we're going to lean back in and, and put our, you know, chips in that the, in the red square 20 at the roulette table. And it worked. Now, we did some things to kind of expand what we could offer them at the same time. And that worked as well. So, you know, it, it sort of um, addressed the crisis. And then we just sort of said, you know, I'd rather not sweat. Let's just lean into where we're strong, what we know, and where there's a market. And we've never stopped since. So it's been, that's, that's six years now. And, you know, again, it's worked. We've, we've, uh, we've just made the Inc. 5000. You know, we tripled revenue in, in three uh, fiscal years. And, you know, we're, we're, you know, on a big run rate. And so at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I think. If we have an expertise and there's a market, a, a, a not limitless, but a huge market for our expertise, and then you layer on to it the portfolio companies, it could be 30,000 of them that all need what we have for certain set of reasons, then you kind of go, okay, I can ride this for a long time. And, you know, and I can enjoy it. Be good at it. There's, 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 you know, there's such gratification about being an expert in something and and enjoying the work you do and who you do it with and for. That's its own reward. And I call it the boredom factor, or the you know, the rinse or repeat factor. You know, it's just not gonna worry about it. I feel like you know, Scott, it's it's a great lesson for all of us, and and I hear it time and time again, even on the podcast, which is. When times are tough, we go back to the fundamentals. We go back to the things that always are tried and true work. And sometimes uh, I'll, I'll include myself in this bucket. There's new shiny things that attract me or, or people and companies. And it sets us off the course of what maybe we should be doing sometimes. And so I love that lesson because it's like, you really just went back to the fundamentals of what made you successful. And you're like, boom. Now we're back on track, right? And that's, I guess, yeah, one look. of the disadvantages of niching because you you get bored. People get bored, right? So, what were you going to say? Look, it's it's a uh, it's a personality, you know, commonality among anybody who's comes out of the agency world, which is we, we bore easily, and we're always looking for the bright shiny objects or the things, you know, the the dragons to slay to you know um, uh, challenge yourself and to prove your worth and all that good stuff and that doesn't go away you know again we are working with some we work with a lot of you know about half our clients right now have products and services or i'll call it internal uh, politics or whatever that i just you know i haven't really encountered before and so we have enough of the you know it's scratching going on that there's a wonderful balance but we know darn well who would side the bread is buttered and I'm not running away from that. I mean, and again, it's it's pretty cool to be, you know, kind of the kind of the dude in America on something. And you know, again, these are the wealthiest, smartest, most driven people on the planet. And like, I'm part of the boys' club, 
and and girls club, but really boys club. And it's kind of cool. You know, I can I'm I'm not a name dropper by by personality, but I can walk into any boardroom in private equity in America and start dropping names and in 30 seconds. I'm part of the boys club. And what and a piece of that, by the way, which everyone talked about was our foundational client in private equity. Is a firm that everybody in private equity in America knows in one second that's called Antares Capital. Um, we were there at the very beginning when these guys, these 12 guys set up shop and we built their brand from scratch. And today they're they're the franchise in the credit side of middle market deals. And they probably have 400 employees. They're owned by the Canadian government. You know, uh, eight years ago, I think the, 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 the division was spun off by G Capital for $12 billion. So I, again, forget the name dropping. I can walk into any private equity shop in America and say, yeah, I created the Antares Capital brand. Instant credibility. Who doesn't love that? I mean, that's just, you know, at, at, from, a, from a career perspective and, a, you know, who are you, a game you play perspective, it's the best. And, you know, I'm, I'm still in touch with a bunch of guys from the terrorists. They've been, you know, kind of lifelong business friends. And, and so it's, it's just that, like, who's going to walk away from that, right? It's great. Um, Scott, I have one last question. I know we only have a few more minutes. I really appreciate you sharing your journey, your expertise. Everyone should check out monogramgroup.com to learn more. My last question is kind of along that line of mentors in the business and, and what you learn from some of these mentors. It's a great question, and I have an immediate answer. Um, I formed in the last nine months a board of advisors with three folks, one of whom was my first client in Terrace Capital, uh, Dave Swanson, who, you know, has, has been, a, again, a colleague, but a lifelong, for, you know, 25-year friend. Um, another a colleague, uh, Dan Bauer, um, who was a client for five years and then became a very close friend and a, and a colleague. He's now part of our team. And Dan works on, you know, eight of our gigs a year and doing the research and strategy stuff. He and I divide and conquer that. And then my mentor, Bob Ritter, um, from Baltimore, where I'm from, who I worked for for five years, again, been a, a dear friend ever since. And I formed this uh, group to um, provide structured, you know, feedback and counsel and tell me some tough news, things I, you know, maybe don't want to hear and should be doing and so on and so forth. But they all bring something different to the table from a personal, professional, you know, career industry perspective. And going forward until, you know, I cash out, they're going to be a hugely valuable, critical piece of things to me. And, and again, it's, it's, you know, pulling together some guys I dearly love and, and, and I, whose, whose counsel and their perspectives I trust for. And again, they each bring something different to the table. That's pretty cool. Everyone check out monogramgroup.com or episodes of the podcast. Scott, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Scott. Jeremy, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And it was a great time. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like a peach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. Ooh.